All right, folks, for those that don't know me, my name is Jack Spirico. I am uh, the founder of the Survival Podcast, which is what I'm probably most known for, but I'm here today primarily as the CEO of Perma Ethos LLC, uh, which is an organization that I and some partners formed uh, about a little over a year ago. And um, just kind of like to share with you one little factoid as we start off here. Uh, we sold over 1,300 PDCs in our first year in business. And that means 1,300 people now have the power of permaculture as designers in their hands. Yeah. What gets cooler, and I'm telling you this because I'm going to talk to you more about sales and marketing than plant propagation today, is we sold 1,000 PDCs in two hours and 15 minutes. So... What I actually want to tell you today is if you're here to learn about how to propagate plants, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm actually going to talk a lot more about the business side of things. And what I want to start off with is two things that you absolutely need to know if you're going to run a business and be able to effectively sell. A definition of sales and marketing. Marketing is an exposure to a belief, and sales is a transfer of a belief. This is what I call an absolute definition. I'm the only person I know teaching these two things this way. Commit them to memory. And now you know everything you need to know about business so everybody can leave. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, the reason that I use these definitions is when you tell people things like, I'm a good salesman, or this is effective marketing strategy, they have this link in their head to corporate America. And what I'm here to tell you is if you practice these definitions, not only are they the most effective way that you can practice sales and marketing, but they will lead you to absolutely ethical business practices. It's not a exposure to excitement. It's not an exposure to an impulse. It's an exposure to a belief, which means you cannot expose your market to it if you don't believe it. And when you transfer from the marketing component to the sales component, and this is a common thing with people that don't have a real effective business discipline in their lives, they think marketing and sales are the same thing. They're not. There's a place where you actually, it's like a key point in water management, where you transfer from concave to convex, and it's when you go from exposing your market to a belief to actually taking the belief that you have and transferring it to them. And that means you can never sell anything that you don't believe in. You can never sell anything to anybody that you don't think should have it. And you can't ever take advantage of anybody ever. And it's that simple. And that means that this leads to ethical business practices. Yeah. Now, the, the funny thing is it also leads to like selling 1,000 PDCs in two hours. Because if you actually believe what, you, what you're selling in, then you actually have the ability to transfer that. And the reason most people can't sell is because they're in some kind of a job selling something for money instead of actually transferring the belief that they have. So everybody in here believes in what you're doing or you wouldn't be here with, with all of us today. You wouldn't have spent the money and the time to be here. That means you're overflowing with belief. That means that every single person in here that wants to be in a business and be successful in a year or two can. And I have some really important words for you at the end today. But what I'm going to tell you is if you're not, it's because you've made an excuse. I know that's not what you came here to hear. But if you know me, you should have expected it. <laughs> like I said, this is going to be on the business side of things more than the propagation side of things. If we were going to do a how-to course, our instructor for our plant propagation course there, Mr. Ferguson, he should be here. You see he's a propagation specialist. He's been busy propagating. <laughs> And he's recently propagated anew, and his lovely wife is due to have a baby like today or tomorrow. So he couldn't come. He's our one partner that wasn't here today, but I wanted you guys to see him. So given the theme of being here talking about the business of plant propagation, and, and the business principles I'm giving you today would work for any business, there's what I call six abilities that any business has to have to be successful. Uh, you can't have four and really be successful. You've got to have them all. And the first one's marketability. And I believe in making things like dead simple. So marketability of your business is simply your ability to tell a story. If you can tell a compelling story that you believe in and expose your market to that belief system, you're going to generate interest in your business. A lot of times I put things in a list and say there's no importance to the order. This time it's actually really important to the order. Once you have marketability and you can tell your story, we're human beings and we parrot things, we repeat things. Who has told a story during this conference about something that happened to you? Okay, so we naturally do that. So if I make my story about my business simple, easy, compelling, and interesting, you might want to write those down, simple, compelling, 
right? I just made them up, but write it down anyway, so I sound smart. But if I do that, then you will then go out and tell people about my business for me, and my business now has referability, which means I get more interest without spending any money. I like that, all right? Because that allows me to get more business with less inputs into my business, right? Create a surplus. Then I have to have profitability. And the reason I have to have profitability is if I have marketability and referability without profitability, I go broke faster. Hmm, it doesn't like the laser. Anyway, it, you got that? If I have marketability and referability without profitability, I go bankrupt faster. Because that means for every unit that I'm selling, I'm losing money, so the more I sell, the faster I go broke. So I have to build profitability into the system or I kill myself with success. I have to have repeatability. Now, a lot of people talk about repeatability from the standpoint of, can I bring somebody in like a McDonald's and train somebody on fries in 15 minutes? I don't mean that. What I mean by repeatability is I want my customers to come back and buy from me again and again and again. Otherwise, I have to go through the education process, the marketing process, the sales process, et cetera, over and over and over for every single sale. So I want a business that encourages people to come back and buy again. I have to have adaptability. Who saw Mark's presentation? Mark Shepard's, right? Basically, the message was, you know this great book on keyline design? Yeah, it works that way one time out of a thousand. Here's my adapted method. It works, but you have to change it to make it work because the book lies, right? Well, every business plan is full of lies. Write that down. Every business plan is full of lies. They're not intentional lies. You're doing your best guess when you're writing your plan, and that means you're going to run into those lies, and you have to be able to adapt to them. And then scalability. So if you have a business where you can grow a little plant that you sell for $1,000, that's great. But if you can only sell one, how many people can afford to live on $1,000 a year and do all the things you want to do? <laughs> so you have to be able to scale the business up. If you have those six things, your business will be successful. And if it's not, it's because you didn't work hard enough. It's just the way it is, guys. So if we're going to be marketable and we're going to tell stories, I want to give you an example of a real story, the story of the Phoenix Tears goji berry. So I, I heard about this gentleman that grows these guys, and he found them on a ranch in Utah, riding around with a buddy, dug some up, took them home, and planted them, and they grew. And then he ate them, and they were good. And he said, what are these things? So we researched it, and he found out, you know, goji berries actually have a market, and people want them, and how did they get in the middle of the, the desert? Well, the, as they were constructing the Transcontinental Railroad, Chinese immigrants that worked on the railroad ate these things in spades, so they probably got there and some Chinese workers poop, right? We're propagating because they're a seed and they're not going to throw their food away. So they grew out in the middle of the desert. They survived out there. He went and had them tested and they like tested through the roof for nutrition, like high even for a goji. So he put that story together and he doesn't have a patent on this plant because it's a naturally growing open source plant. But he trademarked the name Phoenix Tears. He has an 80 foot row of these, he sells leaves, berries, and cuttings and rootings, and he makes $40,000 a year off an 80-foot row of goji berries. Wow. And he does that not only because he sells them and does all the parts, because he makes a lot of money, make a bulk from that, but anybody that wants to sell his cuttings under his name gives him a dollar for every one they call the Phoenix Tears goji when they sell it. You can propagate it. The truth is, you can tell most of this story about any goji berry. You don't have to call it the Phoenix Tears. This is, this is the story of this plant. So I started looking these plants up because I'm like, I want to grow this. So I went to like Rain Tree Nursery and I'm like $24.95 a piece. Fine, I'll order one. Ordered two. They came and they looked like somebody stepped on them. I put them in the ground. They're like, I hate you for planting me here, you jerk. <laughs> like these things are fragile. I found a backyard nursery and I bought 25 of them for $2 a piece. And they were beautiful. And I planted them and they're like, I love it here. I'll grow for you. I like alkalinity. So I'm like, I wonder how hard these things are to make. So I took some green stem cuttings off, not knowing what I'm doing, because I hadn't taken Nick's course yet. I stuck them in some flower pots, and in five days, they looked like that. I wish everything propagated that easily. These are $20 plants. To take a cutting and stick it in a pot, it's printing money. <laughs> now, I'll tell you how I would tell this story in my nursery if I wanted to be successful selling these. I'd probably get a whole bunch of them, and I'd take that catalog page right out of uh, Rain Tree Nursery where they're $24.95, and I would take a picture of one I bought from them, and I would put it right underneath there, and then I'd have my beautiful one sitting there for $10. 
because I'll make all of these you want. If anybody wants to buy a thousand of these for ten dollars a piece, come see me. <laughs> or I could sell you one and you could make your own. But I mean, does that put it in perspective for you, the value of something like the skill of plant propagation? Because they don't all propagate this easily, right? But we have to tie this into a business system to really see its power. And what I want as I go over what I'm doing, I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of a view of my setup. Um, this is where our nursery is, this little bitty red square right here. And we're still under its construction. This is a uh, three-quarter acre area that's being managed as food forest. There's a swale there. There's a swale there. There's this really cool jig. Uh, oh, well, if somebody else can't see, then if I move. Um, then there's this really cool swale right here. Right? And, and um, this takes water about 300 feet all the way back here. And this is all really awesome plant material that we can take and propagate in the nursery. And then this is an urban zone one garden that we show people you can do at a small place. And we take all that plant material and take it there and propagate it. And then this is a zone two area, these two areas here. And what I'm going to be talking about next is an experimental apple orchard that's going in here. Material over there to propagate. How big is it? This is three acres. And this is a one acre horrible area that we're going to work on that we're going to put in a major overstory. Um, and this is roughly a little bit more than an acre. And these white lines are fencing that we just put in. So we're running a duck system. The ducks are here. They're about to be moved here. And it's a three paddock system for the ducks that they rotate around in. So there are partners in all of this. And uh, once they move here, this fence is going to bend like that. There's going to be a door right there, and a door right there, and a door right there. And in the morning, we just open a different door, and the ducks go to whatever paddock we want them on that day. But right here, all of this propagation is being done in this little bitty area right there. And all these high-end plantings that we have being loved on in these environments provide us all the material we need to go to that one little area and make money to propagate money and life, which is even better. Um, this looks much like you know, your typical orchard. And it sort of is. It's going in that little oval I showed you there. But these are going to be apple trees. And these are going to be a really high diversification of old, apple, old cider apples. Um, I decided if I'm going to be in a propagation business, I want to propagate something in demand. So as I tried to find all the different things I wanted to propagate, the stuff I couldn't find, that's what I want to do. Right? So when I saw a site selling these apple trees and saying we're now taking orders for 2017, bing, 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 that's the business I want to be in. So that area that we have is fenced in already, and that means we can keep the birds out unless we want to put them through. And don't get hang, hung up on my terrible design skills. I'm an awful artistic designer. You don't have to be good at this. There's people that are if your client wants it. But there's going to be... Uh, whole bunch of different perennial herbs planted into this system. Mark Shepard's killed my laser. Um, and then each of these trees, instead of being single trees, are actually, we're going to go with the Dave Wilson strategy, not with four though, but with two trees in every hole. And train them out into six foot canopies on each side. That gives us massive diversification because I want information out of here, not just trees. Because what old apple from southern England does well in north central Texas for cider production? You know who knows that? Nobody. This is going to tell me that, and I'm going to be able to provide these trees to people establishing orchards under this, this cider boom all over the south, because I'll have that information. As much as I'm about to show you that it's going to come out of this one little tenth of an acre space, the biggest product that comes out of here is information. If I only get five apples that are really awesome for making real hard cider, not this angry orchard crap, right? <laughs> if I only get five of them, I've got a home run. And I can, you know, sell the material to you guys so you can do it. But this is what's going in. These are the apples that are going in that one little tiny area right there. Um, some of this stuff, I didn't know what it was last year. And that's kind of encouraging as well because I just found out by doing the research. It turns out there's, there's four primary apple types, bitter, sharp, bitter, sweet, sweet, and sharp, that are used in the English method of cultivating cider. And I looked at the Spanish and the French. And I didn't like them, so I decided to go with the English version. Because it was easy to do what? Why do you think I chose this? This is simple, so it's easy to do what? Tell a story. If I tell you four things, you'll probably remember at least two of them. If I tell you the six varieties in the French that use words that you're not familiar with, you probably won't remember them. So since I want to make my product marketable, I went with the simple version that gives a good quality product. But 
What I want to do is find at least two of each variety that do well in my climate to produce the right bricks levels, acidity levels, etc. Now, I'm not suggesting you necessarily do this because I don't want you to compete with me. Now, I do whatever you want, but what I'm saying is this is how you, you go down and find an opportunity. A simple market analysis. What's trending right now? Everybody remember when the microbrew thing happened and it caught on and everybody was you know, putting in microbreweries? And all of, those, all of those little companies, all they had to do was buy barley and hops and get it everywhere. These guys can't get apples. That spells opportunity. But it's not just about apples. So out of this little orchard, we'll get cyan wood for the apples. We'll get black, uh, blackberry cuttings and layers. They're going to go all the way around the circumference. Um, we're going to get designer autumn olives and gummies, southern wine grape cuttings. Hey, you might as well sell it to the people making wine too, right? I'm going to get everybody drunk and then they'll believe what I'm saying and we'll all do permaculture. <laughs> Goji cuttings, because they're easy. Aronias, elders. I have a kind of self-invested <laughs> self interest in these two. I'll explain that in a bit. Um, herbal cuttings, comfrey, valerian, echinacea, bee balm, lemon balm, stone root, blood root, dream root, and anything else that's perennial that people that come to my farm will buy. It's like a little cash machine on a tenth of an acre. So who here would like to own 100 acres? Who here has 100 acres? Okay, you guys are lucky. We have to make money on a tenth of an acre. This is one way you can do that. When it comes to methods of propagation, there's more than this, but the six that are used the most for production of plants for selling are hardwood cuttings, softwood cuttings, propagation from seed, grafting, layering, and division. Since you guys are permaculturists and you want to create new, exciting stuff, it's really important to understand there's only one of these that's not a form of cloning, and that's from seed. And I don't think we do enough propagation from seed. And I'll tell you in a bit how much propagation you can do from seed in a little tiny space, because everything's trees are huge. You can put 10,000 tree seeds in a 4 by 8 bed, one inch apart. You really can. And they can grow into a nice little whip for a year there, and you can send them anywhere you want them to go after that. And it costs less to ship them when they're little like that. These other methods, though, allow you to do things like, well, once you figured something out that works and you want to make lots of it, these are the ways that you do just that. Hardwood cuttings are dead simple, and some things work well, some things don't. But it's pretty much you take the cutting when the wood is dormant, the same time you would take it for grafting as scion, and you stick it into moist soil, it calluses over the winter, and it puts out roots, and it grows. If you have a plant that produces from that, there's no reason not to do it because it's so simple. Um, softwood cuttings are a little bit more reliable and work with a lot more things, and there's a lot of things you can do to tweak it and figure out what will make a plant reproduce with a softwood cutting. But the holy grail is what's called intermittent mist. I'm not going to tell you how to do that today, but if you give us lots of money, we'll give you a course that tells you how. Um, but seriously, this allows you to make that, again, in that same 4x8 bed with intermittent mist, you can do 10,000 cuttings on one inch spacing. That's a lot. That means if you sold your cuttings wholesale for a dollar a cutting well rooted instead of growing them out, that a 4x8 bed can produce $10,000 worth of cuttings in a single season. Square foot garden that. Propagation from seed, I think everybody's familiar with, but when you get into trees and bushes, you do have to learn about scarification and stratification because a lot of the plants have different methods that are necessary. Um, everybody wants, I need nitrogen fixers. Mimosa. Mimosa grows through half the country. You dump hot water on it, that's it, and it'll grow. <laughs> um, you take water, boil it on your, your stove, Take it off, let it stop boiling, put your seeds in a jar, dump the water on it, let it soak overnight. Set them on a wet paper towel the next day at room temperature. When they start to sprout, plant them. All the nitrogen fixtures you want. You can buy, I think, like a thousand seeds from Sheffield's for mimosa for like 10 bucks. Or go find a mimosa tree in the fall. Either or. Um, apples. Usually it's, say, 60 days of uh, stratification. Uh, I've been doing it with paper towels and bags in the refrigerator. Vermiculite works much better. Uh, you don't get mold if you use vermiculite. So there's, I want to give you a, a little bit of an idea of these different methods. But again, I want to talk more about the, the business processes. So I want to explain our system to you. So I'm here telling you how to build a nursery business, and 
I don't have a nursery business yet. I have people trying to buy plants from me before we have them, so that's, that's good. Um, but we're first and foremost a permaculture demo site and homestead producing food, medicine, animal products, and providing a place to learn. That is our primary mission. The nursery is an add-on. Secondly, we are a small farm producing duck eggs. I really think you should specialize in something. I do not specialize in gojis or apples yet. I specialize in ducks. Um, we're doing very well with that. Dorothy ran our advertising again yesterday, and from a few word of mouth things and things like that, we had three chefs contact us yesterday for duck eggs in the Fort Worth area. Un it's unbelievable. The Duck Chronicles, man, that's what it is. It's a virus infecting America. <laughs> but what I want you to understand is those ducks are my marketing team, right? They let me tell a story. People like them. They come there. They buy eggs. A person that will drive an hour and a half to give me $7 a dozen for duck eggs will buy goji plants. So by having something that you anchor down with, no matter what it is, it's probably not ducks for everybody in this room, though I would be for that. I think we need more ducks in the world. But having something that you're known for creates the initial market that then you can build. You know, everybody knows Joe Salatin's fiefdom things. You can have your own little micro fiefdoms. You don't have to have interns running them all or what have you. Um, third, we're a plant producer and nursery. And the reason why we are set up this way is first, we love to practice and teach permaculture. If you haven't noticed, I get kind of excited, <laughs> passionate, and scream at you over the air and stuff like that. That's because I love what I do. And, and I believe this is the way forward. We also desire to produce our own food. I mean, I, I come to a place like this, and they do the best they can with their restaurant and all, but man, eating an egg here is depressing, you know? <laughs> I want my golden yolks back, man. I want to go home. Um, the ducks create the customer base, so why not? You know, why, why fight what works? We were going to sell chicken eggs because everybody buys chicken eggs. Well, guess what? Everybody sells them, too. That sucks. Um, and then we believe in the local food movement. We actually started this little business because my wife doesn't think she does anything because she's nuts, right? She's like, I don't have a job anymore. I'm like, God, you do so much for me. But she wanted something that was hers, so this is more her thing than mine. Um, but we both believe in local food, and we wanted to do something where we weren't just Oh, uh, we're, you know, ex uh, successful yuppies that buy it. We wanted to actually produce it and be part of it and give people that couldn't find something, uh, uh, something that they were looking for. Um, and we realized then, well, if you might as well be successful at it. So if I can, like, make 20 bucks by sticking a plant in the ground, I, I should do that. Because then maybe I could do more good stuff. And we can propagate more than we can ever plant. I only have three acres, guys. I'm rapidly filling it up. Uh, I have to take over the world somehow. And I'm tired and I'm getting old. And it's up to all you young people to go out and march. Because we're going to start an insurrection. You're going to learn that, about that at the end here. Um, <laughs> but right now, if I, can, if I can make more than I can plant, I should. And I think we all should. Our initial nursery said I'm going to go fast through this. We have a 16-foot work and planting uh, grafting bench made of treks and an outdoor sink. You're going to see a picture of that, so I'll skip over. Two seedling beds, two intermittent, intermittent misting beds can make about 30,000 plants a year. I can't plant 30,000 plants a year. Two 1,500 gallon poly tanks with rain catchment, a shore flow pump to put pressure on those tanks for mist and irrigation pressure. You probably don't need that. You might, municipal water, you gotta figure it out for yourself. I have hard water that'll clog the misters in like 15 seconds, so I had to put that in. Um, we have filtered morning shade on the east side of our building, so I don't have to put shade cloth in. The whole thing's, nature took care of it. Um, large grow out area to be mulched with cedar mulch, so that's just to keep this stuff down and keep it from being muddy. It's only about a 600, 700 square foot area, but there's room to put more beds in if we want. And there's six uh, veggie beds that can be turned into more propagation beds at any time that already have irrigation. So that's how we're set up. A couple pictures here. This is the bench we built on the side of the house, so this is the east facing wall. Uh, Trex top, pressure treated lumber, and there's plastic all underneath here, like the stuff you put on the like, roof of a greenhouse. And it goes to this pipe right here. So whenever we water anything up here, none of this stuff gets wet. It all goes down this pipe. And that goes into a swale that feeds the whole system I showed you at the beginning. It ends up all the way in the back of the property and filters all the nutrient that comes out of here through about 800 feet of swale with that pipe. And then this sink for cleaning things off does the same thing. It just drains right into that swale right there. And because this is Trex, it'll probably last longer than me because I am getting old. <laughs> We have another tank just like this on the other side. They're plumbed together at the same level, so they equalize. That goes inside, hits the sure flow plump, and allows us to push water basically anywhere on the property with it. Um, I believe also in like 
path of least resistance. So we bought 50 um, blackberries, and I got another 50 coming. Charlie's inspecting them. And we got, this bothered me that I, I'm like really, I like patterns, and there's one missing. But I'm okay with this, because these are four free ones the guy sent, so it's okay, there's a hole there. And uh, so we bought these 50 blackberries. I need to plant about like 20 of these. So I bought them for $2 a piece, and I'm gonna sell them for eight. And I'm gonna pay myself like 300 bucks to plant 20 plants. I think that makes more sense than giving, you know, Home Depot uh, 200 bucks, 300 bucks. Um, just some other stuff we're doing here. Charlie, again, he likes to pose. Um, these are a lot of the cider apples that came from Cuffle Creek. But this and this, these are 50 goji cuttings that I bought to just increase what I have. I got them for $3 a piece from a backyard grower. Uh, right here is 100 autumn olives, and right there is 50 pecan seedlings. I got these on eBay for 40 bucks for 50 seedlings. You don't have to produce all of your own initially. You can get stock from other places. And you can flip your stock and use it to pay for your equipment. Just eBay, you'd be surprised. And look at the seller uh, reputations. And think about this, the people that are buying these plants from the eBay sellers, they're not you. They don't know what they're doing. They're just throwing in the ground. If the seller has good rep on eBay, he's got good plants. Because that means morons are planting them and they're living. <laughs> Let's take a look at the numbers real quick on a breakdown here. Um, let's think about not selling for a second. You can sell this if you want to. But Nick Ferguson, who put the course together, came up with these numbers. And he said if he was going to plant like a full-on awesome permaculture food forest, this would be what he would use, the numbers of what he would plant. 255 trees, 675 support species, 450 bushes, 25 vines, 450 herbaceous species. And this would be the price each if you paid catalog pricing for them. Uh, this is your total in dollars. And notice that when you add up the support species, the bushes, the vines, and herbaceous, they come up to be a lot more than the trees. Everybody focuses on the trees. But in the end, it's the perennials that get you, is the way Dave Jackie put it to me. He's like, when you start like $5 for this little bitty cutting, and you need 1,000 of them, it adds up quick. Well, then Nick plugged in the hours. And this was very conservative for him. Of course, he's been doing it for 20 years. So we, we might cut our hourly rate in half on our first acre, but this gives you kind of a breakdown. But in the end, what we came up with, and I, I backed out his seeds, because I said, like, you're gonna have to buy the seeds. He said, not after you plant your first acre. But I said, well, okay, I have to plant my first one. So I backed out the seeds. And basically, you can pay yourself $206 an hour in value to propagate your acre of plants, or you can go buy the plants for $20,000. Anybody here got twenty thousand dollars to throw out an acre? Yeah, <laughs> now, now, imagine you really hit a home run with your property, and you get a great big giant five-acre property. It's hundred grand, and, and you start to feel overwhelmed. Like, how am I going to pull this off? It's plant propagation that lets you fund your own planting or sell the plants and fund your own planting, which I like better because I like to use other people's money. Right? So, and if I can give them something of value in return for that money versus just like get it from them, you know, I, I probably would make a pretty good TV preacher, but I probably would have killed myself out of guilt by now, right? Because <laughs> I actually want to exchange value, right? So what would I recommend for you guys if you wanted to be in the plant business? And most of this is going to apply to any business in permaculture. Number one, specialize in something. Don't try to do a thousand things. I know we all want to dream big, and Joel Salton said you can do rabbits and quail, and oh my. No, 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 no. Duck eggs. People buy them. Get the money. Get the customers in, right? Uh, two, a website is not a business, okay? I saw a, recently a GoDaddy commercial, and jo John Lovitz was on. He goes, you have a business? You'll be living on beans from a can, right? And the, the, the assertion was once you've built your, your website, you have a business. No, you don't. A website's a website, but it should be your hardest worker. Please, on your website, tell your customers how to do business with you. Please don't tell, we're wonderful and we have flowers and bees and trees and oh my. And then, how do I get, I want to give you money. And you're at the screen, take my money. And you can't figure out, how do I do business with these people? Specialize in something and tell people how to buy it with your website. Sounds stupid simple. 
I know there's some of you in here, you have websites, I've seen them. It doesn't tell me what you specialize in. It does not tell me how to give you my money. That's why you don't have my money yet. I would have bought it from you by now. Please understand that. Develop compelling stories. If you go to my website, ninemile.farm, for our farmstead, which I don't really publicize through the, like people are like, well, everybody knows you. Our farm is not being built off of TSP. It's being built in Tarrant County on Tarrant County business with Tarrant County people that don't care who I am. <laughs> and you know why I did it? So that no, none of you could ever give me that excuse ever again. I got tired of hearing it. <laughs> this Dorothy Spirico's business, not Jack Spirico's business. Develop that compelling story. You go to that site, you'll see the team. Buddy the Goose is on the team. Charlie and Max are on the team. We have a story. People bring their kids there and the kids are like, there's Charlie. Like Charlie's a celebrity, not me. <laughs> Focus on the market, not the permaculture market. Who here wants money? Okay. See, all of you are in the same business. If you're trying, if you're trying to get his money, you do the same thing. You need to sell to the dummies that are buying from eBay. Put your stuff on eBay. Don't try to emulate me or anyone. Be what you are. Don't put your nursery where I did based on my picture. I put it there because the sun's right. Don't do ducks if you hate ducks. But if you hate ducks, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> develop your skills and develop your knowledge. The knowledge is, is, is everything. But then apply the knowledge. Consider the house flipping model. Buy, improve, and sell. There's so many people selling plants for so cheap if you buy them in bulk. You know, you can wait a year to have your plants ready, or you can start making and printing your own money, but flip some money in the meantime, like we're doing with the blackberries. And I'm looking for more, man. I'm buying everything I can. If I can get it for a dollar a plant, I know I can sell it for three. Who got a 66% who got uh, return on their money last year? In cash. You do what you want with that information. <laughs> All right, um, become a local expert. I mean, if somebody wants to buy my plants across the country, fine. But I go to like Home Depot and I see people making stupid decisions and I go like, stop talking to them. <laughs> Let me tell you the trees you need to buy and these are the plants to buy with them. Here's my card, call my wife, she'll sell you more. <laughs> Share your knowledge until you're told to shut up and then shut up. Be evangelical about permaculture, but don't overdo it. When a person takes, like if you're talking to somebody with glasses on, this is a good business thing for salespeople. If the person you're talking to takes their glasses off and sets them down on the table, they are done. Stop talking. <laughs> Never apologize for your price. How much is that plan? I had a guy ask me, because I just set him up. He's like, how much are you gonna sell those for? I don't plan on selling them for a couple months until they grow out a little bit, for like eight bucks. He goes, that seems expensive. I said, well, they're 10 now. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Go order some plants from a catalog. Go to the box stores. Look at the quality of the plants. Quality of the... <laughs> look at the quality of the plants. And then look at what you do in your backyard. You grow a better product. Don't apologize for it. Get started. Make plants. I don't care. Once you start, it is addictive. And spread the addiction. This is like taking the best drug ever. I did my first grafting this year, and I grafted some stuff onto an apple. I found out Ein Schimmer is a terrible apple. Kevin Hauser from Cuffle Creek said it's, it's a despicable, detestable. It's detestable. I went, I planted three, crap. So I went and took all these other good apples, and I pruned it all off on the scaffold, and I multi-grafted it. And I'm looking around, what else can I graft? Because it's, it's, it's creating life, folks. It's pretty awesome when you think about it. Consider our course. Um, Nick Ferguson, who you saw, is a propagation specialist. He's very good at what he does. Propagates kids, propagates plants. He <laughs> teaches you about timing, tools, disease and pests, uh, growing mediums, intermittent mist, site and cost assessment, propagation methods. He goes into seeds, cutting, division, root cutting, layering. Uh, we give you everything you need to set up and start propagating plants now. Um, Nick's been doing this since he's 12. That means he believes what he does. You don't do anything from the time you're 12 until your mid-30s and not change. He says, I don't have a problem and the meetings I go to are only for the coffee. 
If you want to take our course, it's 350 bucks. This is a discount code I will read off twice and only twice. And I'll never tell you again. PV2, PPC2015. PV2, PPC2015. 25 bucks off for the next 30 days if you want to take the course. We just did four hours of Q&A by phone that we added to the course, and we'll keep adding more to it. Uh, we never told the students that initially bought it that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit now about the opportunity. Like, how much opportunity is really there? We, like, when we created Perma Ethos, we were like, we wanted to do great things. And we had, it took like a year to find ourselves. And we were con contacted by a listener who's basically a site-level CEO for an Alcoa plant. And he said, I want you to come out here and look at 500 acres. We got there, 500 acres miraculously turned into 1,400 acres. Um, and we went in and we looked at it and we went, we've got to do commercial level stuff here. I mean, this is not your hippie swales, right? <laughs> so we brought Mark Shepard's team in with us and we designed out this 1,400 acres and it looks like we're just going to go steaming along with it. In fact, we did a press release and we submitted it to their you know, main corporate and the communications director said, you know what, we don't do co-sponsored press releases. But this one makes us look so good. We're going to rewrite it and make sure it passes all our corporate BS, and we're going to go ahead and run this with you. That's a Fortune 500 brand doing permaculture, folks. And they need plants. And if we do this right, 50 miles away, they have 12,000 acres they want to turn us loose on next. For this one site, they need 11,000 pecans and 1,200 chestnuts and 2,800 honey locusts. But I said it's the perennial herbaceous level that gets you. So remember what I said I was going to plant in my little orchard? Right? They need 28,000 aronias and 57,000 elderberry plants on one location and an alley cropping model because they don't want to alley crop zucchini like Mark Shepard did. They want something that's perennial. That's one installation. This stuff's catching on. I mean, the people in the 80s took their PDC back to 70s, thought this was going to be the way things were right away. It's taken until now. The insurrection's on, baby, man. We're in the middle of a revolution. <laughs> when I'm done, uh, I'm going to take questions probably from outside because I'm pretty sure I'm going to exceed my time limit because that's what I do. Um, but I do have this presentation, a bunch of other really cool stuff on some thumb drives. They're 25 bucks. Joe will have them in the hallway. <laughs> um, but I do have some discounts on there, 25, 20 bucks off my MSP program. Um, I also have a discount for $100 off of our PDC at Perma Ethos and $50 off the plant course. So it kind of pays for itself. And the drive's really cool too. Um, I've got episode one through 20 of the Duck Chronicles on there. And I've got a link to a page with a bunch of other stuff you can download because I overfilled the eight gig drive. So I ran out of room. Um, but a lot of cool stuff, if you want, you can come pick those up. I'll leave it on that for a second. Because I want to give you some resources. And then I want to leave you with something really, really important to understand. Number one, uh, permaethos.com. That's where you can get all our great courses and learn about the great work we're doing. Survivalpodcast.com. It's because TSPers are awesome. Yeah. Duckchronicles.com. Learn about our ducks. It's just re... re uh, redirects you to our playlist, but Duck Chronicles, that's really my evil plan. See, I trick you. People watch this with their kids, look at the little ducks. And like episode 20, let's talk about the hydrology of swales. <laughs> this is awesome, and they wouldn't listen before the cute ducks suckered them in. Uh, I have a resource page, survivalpodcast.com permaculture, and all my social media. And when I talk to people like this at a place like this, I usually end with like, you know, something awesome like Masanuba Fukuoka, you know, the dragonfly will be the messiah or whatever. <laughs> and I, I, I want to say this because I originally had it planned. And I do think this is true. The ultimate goal, goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. I, I think that's awesome. And I like stuff like that. But I also realize, like, okay, there's, like, being nice, and then there's, like, getting stuff done. And when I come to these things, I have so many of you guys that come up and you tell me, I want to do this, or I want to do that, or I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Okay, don't take this wrong, but shut up and go do it. Seriously. It is time for doing. There isn't a person in here that doesn't have enough belief to transfer that you cannot be successful. 
The longer you wait, the older you get, the less energy you have to get it done. Go do it now. And you know, we use the word revolution in what we're doing. This isn't a revolution. The revolution started in 1978. Revolutions are a change in power structure in a relatively short time. They can be violent or nonviolent, but basically a revolution is a transfer of power from one group of leaders to another. This is an effing insurrection. You got that? This is an insurrection. This is long term. They had a chance to surrender in 78. 30 years later, they had a chance to surrender in 2008 when I started my show. They didn't surrender. We aren't going away. And guess what? We're planting food. You know how you defeat a revolution? You starve out the revolutionaries. You can't starve us. We're planting trees. <laughs> starve me, I'm going to eat duck eggs and apples and pears and fruits. This is an insurrection, guys. And what the difference is with an insurrection is instead of taking the power from one group of leadership and giving it to another, an insurrection takes the power away from those in power and puts it in the hands of the insurrectionists. That is you. Take your power back. Take your country back. Take your world back. You are not a parasite. I, I, I cannot stand purple people telling us that we're parasites. We create life. We create life. We are the only creature on this planet that can consciously decide to create life. Nobody, no, nothing else does that. They might do it, but they do it one way. We can design it into the system. We are a regenerative force. Your power has been stolen by a power elite that's convinced you you are a virus. You are the cure. And the cure comes in many forms. It's not just planting trees. It's not just building swales. It's being economically viable. It's giving yourself the freedom. I can come talk to you guys because I have a successful business. The rich guy picks up the tab at dinner. Duh! Be successful. Get out of your 40-hour week jobs. Take your life back. Take your families back. Take the world back. Thank you. Thank you.